First of all, welcome everyone to uh, a virtual Psyche meeting. Um, it's always my honor and pleasure to be invited by uh, Gary Bloom and um, the Psyche organizing committee to uh, give these talks on various things from MTC to advanced thyroid cancer. Of course, many of you all know MTC is my true passion. Um, uh, I, uh, I do hope that everyone is healthy and safe, and certainly these virtual meetings allow for people to come from all over the world to attend and listen to these sessions. So I think it uh, allows for greater accessibility, but certainly in my mind, nothing beats being um, in live person, interactive with all of you lovely people so that we can really have dynamic interaction and conversation even outside of our sessions. So I hope Hope um, in next year we could potentially be gathered together in person. All right, so uh, today my task is to talk about medullary thyrocarcinoma. What do I need to know and do now at the beginning of this journey? And um, this was actually um, a topic that Gary and I talked about just recently in the last week as we were modifying the session to meet the needs of our participants. And um, so just real quickly, these are my disclosures. And um, during this session, what I hope to be able to address are the following questions. And it's really directed for those patients or family members who are new to this diagnosis. And I would estimate maybe uh, within the last two years, you've been diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer. So um, some of the, the these uh, discussion points um, based at least on the attendee list. Many of you all might have heard before from me personally during uh, visits with me or uh, potentially at other FICA meetings, but um, hopefully um, it still is engaging and um, reinforces some thoughts that maybe you already knew or you didn't know. So we're going to talk about what is medullary thyroid cancer, uh, what is a germline versus a somatic mutation, how do we assess for extent of disease, um, either at the very beginning uh, with various imaging um, or even along the way? Um, what treatments are considered early on in the disease uh, course? And how do we monitor medullary thyroid cancer after initial therapy? Um, and then when do we need to consider systemic therapies, what we call chemotherapy? So just right off the bat, thyroid cancer comes in various flavors or subtype. The majority of thyroid cancer is differentiated thyroid cancer. This means that uh, the thyroid cancer emanated from thyroid follicular cells. Follicular cells are what are the normal cells in our thyroid gland that produces thyroid hormone, T4. Um, so the majority of thyroid cancer is made up of differentiated thyroid cancer, and the most common is papillary thyroid cancer. After that is follicular thyroid cancer, and we can see a subtype of Herthel cell um, carcinoma. Medullary thyroid cancer is a more rare subtype, and it emanates from the C cells or calcitonin producing cells of the the thyroid gland. And um, uh, out of all thyroid cancer, MTC comprises about uh, one to 2% of all thyroid cancer. Anaplastic thyroid cancer is a much more aggressive and uh, fortunately a more rare type of cancer. And these are just some histology um, pathology slides kind of showing you what it looks like, um, but medullary thyroid cancer um, has a lot of this kind of amyloid proteinaceous fluid. Um, so it looks like this kind of pinkish um, uh, material under the microscope. So medullary thyroid carcinoma as a entity, as a formal diagnosis is relatively young in its uh, terminology. Um, it was first described in 1959. So when you think about the history of medicine, um, the diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer is relatively young. And it is rare, about 1,200 um, maybe uh, less cases are diagnosed in a year in the United States. And as I said, these uh, cancers arise from abnormal um, in the parafollicular C cells of the thyroid gland. So this is a little cartoon here 
just kind of uh, giving a schematic of uh, the follicular cell, this big kind of squarish one with its nucleus. But the C cell is sitting in between these little follicular cells and they produce calcitonin. And um, these C cells um, just happen to reside in the thyroid gland. Um, they are uh, derived embryologically from neurocrest cells um, and neurocrest cells can give rise to other kinds of cells in the body like parathyroid tissue, adrenal tissue. Um, uh, but this, uh, this C cell um, ends up uh, localizing in the thyroid gland. But it doesn't have any physical or uh, hormonal interaction with the thyroid follicular cells. So we don't consider this to be a differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, and thus, we do not treat it with radioactive iodine. And we don't need to suppress the TSH, um, which are modalities of treatment for the differentiated thyroid cancer patients. C cells, again, um, just to kind of show you another way, this is under the microscope and in this little blue uh, box here, you see these kind of grayish dots lining in circles. Those are the follicular cells and um, inside they store thyroglobulin and thyroid hormone. But in between these follicular cells, the ones that are currently stained red, those are the C cells. And so C cells really comprise only 1% of all thyroid cells. So this entire meaty thyroid gland, only 1% of them are C cells. Uh, it's amazing how this little cell population can wreak so much havoc in our patients. And, um, but uh, it gives us a, 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 um, a respect for these cells. Um, and then, uh, so with medullary thyroid cancer, the first thing that comes to anyone's mind uh, from a clinical perspective is, could this be part of a hereditary syndrome called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2A or 2B? So MEN2 is the syndrome. And so from all comers, all patients with medullary thyroid cancer, about a quarter of them um, had the cancer develop because of a mutation that they might have inherited from one of their parents. So this is what leads to um, a, this is a germline mutation, um, uh, meaning it's a mutation that came from an egg or a sperm. And that mutation led to abnormalities in the C cells giving rise to the medullary thyroid cancer. Um, uh, and just so you know, if we do a very thorough discussion with the patient themselves and even their family history, and we see uh, have no other members in the family with medullary thyroid cancer, no other members or the person, the patient having any issues with parathyroid disorders or a, an adrenal tumor called pheochromocytoma, if we still do the genetic test, we'll pick up about one to 7% of those patients will have the mutation, meaning that just because there's no family history of other tumors suggests of MEN2 uh, MEN doesn't mean that there's no mutation in this patient. So um, we definitely recommend uh, genetic testing for all patients who are diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer to rule out that possibility. Um, and in later slides, you'll see that it has relevance, not just for the patient regarding whether they are at risk for the other endocrine tumors associated with the MEN2 syndromes, but also with, of course, their family members and counseling um, them appropriately. So long story short, everyone should get a genetic uh, blood test for this germline mutation. And um, just so you know, I put out down in these slides a little asterisk with the orange uh, like uh, for definitions. So what is sporadic? So sporadic apparently is, means that's non-hereditary. But I said here, apparently sporadic, meaning you're, you've explored the patient's history, we've explored the patient's family history, no one else has any tumors or thyroid cancer. It looks like it might be sporadic sporadic or non-hereditary, but we do the genetic test and lo and behold, we see a genetic mutation found. Um, what is the uh, syndrome again? So this is multiple endocrine neoplasia type two. It's due to, an, uh, going back to our biology class in high school, an autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning only one parent um, with one uh, of their uh, uh, chromosomes having the mutation will pass 
could potentially pass it on to their offspring. And it's a 50 50 chance because, you know, um, it, we pass on uh, one of the two sets of our uh, DNA. So this is a, a germline mutation. Again, germline means that it came from a reproductive cell, an egg or a sperm of the gene called the RET proto oncogene. So, um, RET, just in case people uh, like trivia, RET stands for rearranged during transfection. And this gene, when it's abnormal, it will uh, produce a receptor called the RET receptor or the RET tyrosine kinase receptor. And I say all these words because uh, we'll talk about medicines that target the tyrosine kinase receptor, RET, and other tyrosine kinases. Um, the, the actual diagnosis of multiple endocrine neoplasia type two, uh, uh, type two syndrome um, uh, wasn't really coined until 1993. So again, a relatively young syndrome in terms of a recognition and definition. So MEN2A is the most common of the two hereditary syndromes, uh, comprising about 95% of our hereditary population. Uh, MEN2B is the more rare uh, one. And actually, interestingly enough, the majority of patients who have MEN2B, they are the very first person in their family to have the mutation. So actually, when you test both of their parents, their parents are negative for the mutation. So the patient themselves was the first one to develop it. And this is what we call a de novo mutation occurring for the first time in that family member. Um, so that's the situation about 75% of the time with the MEN2B syndrome. This is a cartoon just showing you what are the tumors that can be associated with the hereditary syndromes. Um, and in MEN2A, the more common of the two syndromes, um, the majority of patients, more than 95%, will have medullary thyroid cancer, uh, and then 50% will have this uh, adrenal tumor called the pheochromocytoma, which overproduces adrenalines, uh, which can lead to symptoms of high blood pressure, heart racing, jitteriness, anxiety, panicky feeling, um, and just turning pale. Um, then 20% of the MEN2A patients could have parathyroid hyperplasia, where these little glands sitting behind our thyroid gland um, is uh, not listening to our blood calcium, and it keeps on making parathyroid hormone, driving calcium to go up, and thus leading to a risk for kidney stones and maybe fractures. MEN2B on the right side, 100% um, of the patients will have medullary thyroid carcinoma, similar to MEN2A, 50% uh, will have the pheochromocytoma. But different from MEN2A, these patients do not have parathyroid disorders. They don't have high calcium or uh, kidney stones, but instead um, tend to have these neuromas or nodules um, on, in their mucosal surfaces. So uh, tongue surfaces on the gum. Uh, the, their uh, lips, um, in the nasal passages, uh, under their eyelids, and even throughout their intestinal tract. And these neuromas can be very lumpy, bumpy, and um, uh, um, unfortunately, sometimes unrecognized by doctors. I, I actually had a patient who, when he was a kid, um, had all these lumps and bumps on his tongue. He kept like biting on his tongue when he would speak, and it was very problematic and would see like uh, his uh, physician and actually had surgeries to remove these nodules um, on multiple occasions just so that um, uh, he could speak comfortably, but never really putting two and two together that these neuromas were a manifestation of MEN2B. With MEN2 syndromes, typically MTC or medullary thyroid cancer is the first tumor, endocrine tumor to, a rot, to be seen or noted. About 10% might manifest with their pheochromocytoma first. So we can see people like when they're 18 and developing signs and symptoms of pheochromocytoma. There are some uh, variants of uh, the hereditary syndrome 2A. Uh, one of them is called Hirschsprung's disease. This is when at a very young age, even as an infant, um, uh, our patients will have problems with uh, severe constipation, not passing bowel movements, having abdominal distension, feeling very uncomfortable, and uh, their pediatricians just indicate that they have um, uh, poor feeding, and, um, and this is called Hirschsprung's disease 
disease typically associated with a mutation of RET gene at the 609, 611, 618, or 620 uh, codons. And um, oftentimes this is a trigger to for some pediatricians to think, huh, why does my patient have this problem, uh, Hirschbones? And it, it, in a very savvy pediatrician, they will notice this and they will screen for RET mutation and lo and behold, diagnose the MEN2A in that child. Another variant of MEN2A is um, uh, something that's associated with cutaneous lichen amyloidosis. So this is under the skin, a um, deposition of amyloid, a protein. So it's not cancer cells, it's just the protein that can be secreted. And it seems to always want to um, consolidate in the middle of the back uh, between the two shoulder blades. And it can be very itchy, causing people to scratch, 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 and then causes the skin to get thicker and thicker. Like the more you scratch, the itchier it gets and the thicker the skin gets. And um, this is almost always associated with the patients who have the RET mutation at 634. But there has been a few case, uh, one case report in a patient with an 804 mutation, um, but I, I've seen it with a few others as well. But um, when my patients uh, have... Um, when I suspect they have MEN2A, I will ask, do you have an itchy patch over their, your back? And they're like, yes, what is that? And I was like, I bet you, you have a 634 mutation. And lo and behold, the genetic test shows it's a 634. So um, it, it, we really don't recommend any particular treatment for it other than avoid scratching using um, soaps that are um, gentle like Dove and um, keeping it moisturized and uh, trying to not uh, scratch your back like a bear up against a tree. <laughs> um, uh, MEN2B uh, is that more rare of the two syndromes where um, uh, it uh, it's, uh, this is the one where it's not associated with hypercalcemia and uh, the neuroma. So these are just some representative pictures of the lumpy, bumpy tongue, but the neuromas in the lip making it look a little bit thicker and lumpy. Um, this is a, a young man with very thickened lips, almost kind of like kind of pursed out, uh, which some TikTokers might think that that's very attractive right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you can see his thyroid mass there, but uh, these patients tend to have um, uh, a very typical uh, look. So these are two of my patients who actually they are not siblings. Uh, they are completely uh, unrelated, but you can already tell that there are some facial features that are very similar, um, high forehead, uh, longish, thin face, um, the thicker lips, um, a little bit more uh, thickened nose, uh, thicker um, ear lobes. Um, and uh, they also um, don't, it, it, very interestingly enough, they don't make tears. So um, uh, as little babies, when they cry, they will cry loudly, but there will be no tears. And that has to do with abnormalities with the tear ducts. These are some additional features seen with um, our MEN2B patients uh, where uh, they can have very, uh, what we call marthenoid features where you have very, uh, you're very tall, very long arms that go kind of past your mid thigh, um, kind of showing that by this lady over here and her son um, and very uh, spindly long fingers. Um, they're, uh, so, their sternum can be scooped inward. Uh, they have a very high arch in their palate. They can have scoliosis. Um, and also uh, these uh, patients, because of all the neuromas in their intestine, they don't pass stool very well and they can get very backed up or constipated. And so this is a picture actually of this young man where uh, you can see his ribs up here. This is his colon up almost halfway up into his lung space because of the distension of the colon. Very uncomfortable and very problematic. So um, with, uh, as I discussed, we always recommend uh, a RET genetic mutation test. Um, and I'm gonna clarify what this is compared with tumoral testing for mutations, but this is uh, a blood test where they're gonna study the DNA of your uh, the cells to see if there's a mutation. And um, commercially available tests are very good at detecting these RET mutations. Um, you could think about companies like Ambry, Invitae, 
um, new, uh, uh, and also some just go ahead and send it out to Mayo. Um, and um, they're very good at evaluating for uh, the, the mutations that lead to the hereditary syndrome. Occasionally, we will ask for the RET gene to be tested in its entirety, so the entire coding region. Um, and this is mainly when we have patients who have some features still suggestive of hereditary medullary thyroid cancer, like, for example, if they have C cell hyperplasia, so all their C cells in their thyroid tumor had um, a thyroid specimen had a lot of enlargement, or they have lots of um, multiple spots of thyroid cancer, uh, medullary thyroid cancer. Um, or they have some facial features suggestive of MEN2B. Um, but also if by chance um, they have also high calcium with parathyroid disorders, and yet their initial genetic test was negative for a mutation. And when we look at the mutational profile, they didn't check all the entire gene. Then we might send uh, the patient's blood test back and specifically request for the entire coding region just to uh, ensure that we're not missing any rare mutations uh, that could be associated with the hereditary syndrome. Um, but just so you know, um, some tests um, already are doing this now. Um, as science has gotten better and cheaper, um, uh, a lot of uh, commercially available tests have already converted to just checking the entire coding region of the RET gene. When do we check for RET mutation? Like I said, anyone with a diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer. Also, if there is a diagnosis of Hirschsprungs, um, and at the next session, if you all join me, um, I do have a case of a, a, a patient with Hirschsprungs, and it was kind of interesting about how that patient's family came to uh, be notable for their MEN2A. But uh, anyone with Hirschsprungs, anyone with um, pheochromocytoma at a young age, especially if they're less than 18. And then the first degree relatives of people with the RET mutation. So if there's a mutation that leads to MEN2A, we recommend checking first degree relatives before the age of five. And if they have MEN2B, um, checking for the mutation in any uh, family members who are less than a year old. Um, we always recommend genetic counseling for all family, uh, uh, all patients and their families, because um, there are a lot of questions regarding genetic testing, insurance and ramifications, life insurance, all these things that our geneticists can also help with. And also family planning, especially in our young patients who still are childbearing age. Um, I know that although hereditary MTC only makes up 25% of the overall population MTC, um, I do want to emphasize that it's important if you do have hereditary medullary thyroid cancer to know which mutation it was. Is it um, the most um, aggressive uh, form called a 918 in the hereditary group? So I say this very clearly in the hereditary medullary thyroid cancer patients, 918 tends to be more aggressive, mainly because it manifests itself so early on in life, where um, there's actually reports that a two-month-old already had medullary thyroid cancer in an MEN2B situation, and lymph and metastases involving lymph nodes or even in the liver can be found as young as five years of age. It's different compared with um, a 918 mutation in the non-hereditary setting, okay? So I don't want people to start going, oh my gosh, my 918 is the worst one. But in hereditary situation, uh, the, uh, it's considered high risk mainly because um, uh, it just manifests itself uh, so much sooner, which in that case, why there has been a, an association of higher um, uh, uh, mortality, mainly because a lot of times these patients are not identified until they're like teenagers or even in their um, 20s. And they've had disease already gone on to other locations could potentially um, affecting their overall health before they got any recognition and treatment done um, sooner. Now, 634 mutation is truly the most common hereditary mutation of RET in um, uh, our patients, and typically the most common uh, mutation associated with MEN2A, most common one associated with pheochromocytoma, most common one associated with the hypercalcemia in the MEN2A syndrome. So that stated, um, when my patients come to me for the first time and they're like 23, and um, they, I know 
that they have medullary and that's why they're seeing me. But I, uh, they, they told me that, yeah, I have this adrenal mass and I have anxiety. Um, I'm already thinking you probably have a 634 mutation. Um, these patients uh, do tend to have um, a high risk for metastases. More often than not, it's in the lymph nodes first. And there is a, um, a, a, a uh, case reported as young as six years old with having lymph nodes already involved with medullary thyroid cancer in the 634 mutated population. And then everything else is what we call moderate risk. So if you're not 918 or 634, or I didn't say earlier, but 883 in the hereditary setting, then you have a mutation that is considered moderate risk. Uh, patients tend to have um, less aggressive medullary thyroid cancer. They present a little bit later on in life, maybe in their 20s, 30s, sometimes in their 60s. Um, and they have lower calcitonin levels and potentially uh, less invasiveness at the time of their diagnosis because it's just a slower growing um, process. Uh, another reason to know your mutation, uh, as I kind of hinted at earlier, is certain mutations will be highly associated with the other endocrine tumors or neoplasias. Neoplasias is just a fancy word for abnormal tumors. So 634, like I said, is the most common one associated with MEN2A syndromes, most common one associated with FEO, most common one associated with hyperparathyroidism. But if you have an 804 mutation, almost... I mean, I won't say never, but uh, it's rarely associated with pheochromocytoma or hyperparathyroidism, as opposed to like a 609 mutated patient, um, not as much pheo as a 634, but certainly more so than a patient with a 620 mutation. So it, it's, um, and then uh, the 609, 611, 618, and 620 are the patients who tend to have the Hirschsprungs. So um, it's, it's good to know your mutation so that there's a predictable predictive um, a, a way of knowing what other tumors um, a patient might have. Now, the distinction between hereditary versus sporadic, again, sporadic means not hereditary, uh, something that just developed after you were born. So hereditary medullary thyroid cancer, because the mutation is affecting all the C-cells, right? It's a, um, a, a mutation of RET, which is in all the C-cells, these patients tend to have multiple tumors. Uh, they're typically bilateral on both sides of the thyroid gland, multifocal, more than one tumor in the thyroid gland, and associated with C-cell hyperplasia or um, a enlargement of the other C-cells. They are getting there, but they're not quite there at the cancer uh, stage yet. Um, however, just so you know, uh, for those patients who have the non-hereditary forms of medullary thyroid cancer, there can be C-cell hyperplasia because there might have been thyroiditis. So thyroiditis is an inflammatory process where your body just didn't like your thyroid gland, led to a lot of inflammation in the thyroid, um, maybe a, a associated with um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, and that inflammation can cause the C cells to look enlarged and plump. And thus sometimes uh, pathologists will call out C cell hyperplasia. So just because you have C cell hyperplasia and your genetic test is negative doesn't necessarily mean to doubt that genetic test. It's just more that um, it can be seen with thyroiditis. Now, the sporadic or the non-hereditary MTC patients, typically it's just in one spot and in one side of the thyroid gland. But we have had about 20% of um, the non-hereditary patients having multifocal disease. And we actually did um, a study on some of our multifocal medullary thyroid cancer patients. And um, we made sure they had the full RET gene. And there again, no rare mutations accounting for hereditary um, MTC. Um, and uh, we really couldn't figure out um, uh, what was the reason for it. It just sometimes happens. How do our patients with medullary thyroid cancer present? Often there are no symptoms. I mean, it, often you're feeling great and it was just an incidental finding because of some image that was done because you went to a church um, health screening event and they did a carotid ultrasound right there in the parking lot and hey, you have a thyroid nodule or you were in a car accident and you go into the ER and they just pan scan you and they did a MRI uh, or a CT of the neck to make sure you didn't break a bone and hey, you have a thyroid nodule. So sometimes it can be, um, uh, 
uh, uh, no symptoms. If there are symptoms, uh, it can be a neck mask where, you know, uh, someone is just shaving and they're like, oh, I see something in my neck on the, in the mirror, or their lady is putting on some skin lotion. They feel, hmm, what is this nodule here? Diarrhea can be seen in about 30% of our patients. Um, and it doesn't correlate with calcitonin levels. I've had patients with 100,000 calcitonin and no diarrhea. I've had patients with 500 calcitonin and diarrhea. Um, and, it's, and it's not the calcitonin per se that's causing the diarrhea as much as that this type of neuroendocrine cancer produces other proteins or what we call secretagogues. And these proteins can be any of these things that I listed here. You don't have to remember them, but they cause your intestine to not absorb the water from your food very well. And thus you have looser stools, watery stools, um, and it increases um, your intestine to move a little faster. So it's moving the food faster. So you don't have time to absorb all the water. So um, typically the diarrhea is after certain foods, especially um, lactose uh, or dairy products, sometimes alcohol, sometimes vegetables, um, and, um, uh, and occasionally it could wake people up in the middle of the night. Flushing can happen in some patients because um, the other proteins that are made with the, uh, the medullary thyroid cancer uh, cell uh, causes your uh, arteries uh, to dilate. And so you can have this flushing of your face, so just turning red all of a sudden. Usually it's with certain emotional triggers uh, when you're upset or, or, or uh, sad uh, or angry, uh, but it could happen um, uh, with uh, alcohol as well or certain foods. Um, and then Cushing syndrome, this is very rare, luckily, less than 1% of our patients with medullary thyroid cancer, but because it's neuroendocrine and cell lineage, uh, these cells can also abnormally produce um, uh, a hormone called ACTH or uh, CRH or uh, cosentropin releasing hormone. And what these things do is it stimulates the adrenal glands to make abnormal cortisol levels, high cortisol causes people to gain weight, have high blood pressure, a round face, um, um, a muscle weakness, low potassium, and a high blood pressure. So Cushing's can be very debilitating for our patients, and uh, we definitely uh, want to address that um, uh, aggressively. And then um, sometimes it's just because a lab test was drawn. Um, now, I haven't had uh, this as often with just a calcitonin draw, but there are some patients with a thyroid nodule and their doctor likes drawing a calcitonin with it and, and notes of calcitonin is elevated. Um, and then sometimes it's a CEA level or carcinoembryonic antigen. Um, and so um, CEA is, so calcitonin is the very specific, uh, very uh, sensitive marker. It's uh, only made by the C cells, um, but it can be elevated in many different situations. It can be elevated in people with uh, kidney disease. It can be elevated if people do have um, thyroiditis, um, if uh, sometimes they have, um, uh, so I said kidney disease, but um, that uh, sometimes people have um, these um, antibodies in their body that blocks the assay and uh, causes it to uh, measure the calcitonin higher than it actually is. I actually had a patient with that, um, with a high calcitonin uh, that was persistent even after the thyroidectomy. And we then ended up finding that the patient had these um, uh, uh, mouse antibodies that was interfering with the calcitonin machine. Um, CEA is uh, not as uh, specific to medullary thyroid cancer. It could be made by other kinds of tumors, um, lung cancer, especially small cell cancer. It could be made by colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, uh, uh, uterine or uh, ovarian cancer. So other malignancies can make CEA, but we always check it with medullary uh, because it can be co-secreted as well. Um, and so I've had patients refer to me because they had a history of colon cancer. They've been screening the CEA. It went down after initial treatment, but over the years, they keep seeing it rising, and yet there's no evidence of recurrence in the abdomen. And uh, they send them to me, and I find that the patient had medullary thyroid cancer. Um, so 
calcitonin is highly uh, variable. And that's why I say the vagaries of calcitonin. Um, and I always tell my patients when they're first time meeting me is that there's always some expected inaccuracy of the lab test. You go to the same machine, same day, within two hours, you hadn't eaten and you get the blood test done again and it could be different. Um, it tends to be different by orders of magnitude based upon what the number actually is. So if your number is like less than 100, um, the next last test, it could be different by about 10 points. Um, if your levels are in the 500s, uh, it might be different by about 50 points. If it's um, in the 1000, we can see variations of 100 points uh, or even 200 points. Um, I saw a lady just um, today uh, by a video visit and her calcitonin does this little uh, seesawing thing, um, but everything else is very, very stable. So uh, there is that inaccuracy, inherent inaccuracy. Also, food will drive up your calcitonin. So I always tell my patients to get your calcitonin drawn on a fasting specimen, so no food after midnight or at least six hours without any food. Um, you could take your medications with water, that's fine. Um, also, iodinated contrast. So CAT scans that have the contrast with the iodine in it, it causes the um, calcitonin to go up. So try to always do your labs before you get that injection of the contrast uh, for the CT. It doesn't happen with MRI contrast or um, a CAT scan without contrast. It's only when it's a contrast CT. Um, I also tell my patients to just be a little bit thoughtful and not go uh, hog wild, <laughs> and I use that word specifically, uh, two to three days before your lab draw, because um, when you overdo the calorie intake, whether it's food or drink, um, it can uh, cause the calcitonin to pop up. Um, I say this to a lot of my patients because this was a very uh, kind of a, uh, 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 an amusing story. I had a patient who came to me on a Tuesday visit from California. And uh, he had his labs drawn on Monday. Um, but over the weekend, he enjoyed a very lovely uh, wine and cheese and food festival in Napa. And um, he enjoyed himself very well. And when he saw me, his calcitonin was up by like two or 3,000 points. And I'm going, and the imaging, nothing changed. So we were talking about, he's like, could it be all the wine and cheese I ate and drank this weekend? And he happened to be in Houston so um, for another week. So we just had him eat sensibly, eat normal. And then the following Monday, he had another calcitonin drawn and was back towards where it was um, uh, before. So um, so I don't tell my, don't starve yourself before your lab draw, not at all, but just eat your normal amount. So uh, be cautious about around the holidays, especially Thanksgiving, not to overdo all the, the leftovers on the Sunday before your testing. Um, then um, the, uh, we cannot compare the levels uh, directly to outside machines. Even if the machine is the same manufacturer, there's just going to be some inherent differences because of um, uh, the um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, control uh, uh, testing, you know, every machine has to undergo weekly quality testing, and we have a control specimen. And so there might be just some variability. So um, I always tell my patients, your calcitonin last week at that outside lab was 1000. At MD Anderson, it's now 1500. You did not have progression in just that one week. It's just, again, the differences of machine. CEA doesn't tend to have these variable issues. Um, and so um, we, we typically don't see as much variability. But again, you can't compare CEA at one lab with the CEA at a different lab, OK? Um, so with medullary thyroid cancer, unfortunately, at the time of diagnosis, oftentimes there's already going to be metastases, or what that means is spread of tumor outside of the organ of origin. So, you know, a medullary starts in the thyroid gland. So if it's gone to the lymph nodes, that's a metastasis to the lymph node. If it's gone to the lung, it's a metastasis to the lung. And so, um, uh, and this is mainly because medullary thyroid cancer uh, typically, it, does not 
uh, cause any symptoms. So by the time it's found, it may have been there for five, eight years and has had time to move to other locations in the body. And the most common place are the lymph nodes and what we call the central compartment uh, at the base and in the anterior portion of our neck. And that's just because of the drainage pattern of the thyroid gland. So about 80% of our patients at diagnosis will already have lymph nodes involved with their thyroid cancer at diagnosis. Now about 50 10 to 15% might already have evidence of um, spread or distant metastases to other organs, like lungs and liver are the more common locations outside of the neck. Um, and I wanted to emphasize that in the liver, it can be multiple, and they could be very tiny to a point where barely seen on imaging. Um, oh, it, back in the 80s or 90s, actually, our surgeons did exploratory surgery of the liver to see if there were liver metastases. They would do a little incision and explore the liver. We don't do that now uh, because our imaging has gotten better, but it can be um, uh, that small. And um, bone, can be seen uh, with metastases at about 25% of the time at the time of diagnosis. Overall, about 20% of our patients with MTC could have bone metastases. Uh, brain meds is very rare. So we don't often do an MRI of the brain um, for screening um, because honestly, um, when we looked at even our population of patients with all types of thyroid cancer, I think we had over uh, 9,000 patients over a 30 year period, um, only a about um, 80 some patients had brain metastases so it, with medullary fibrous cancer. So it's, it's exceedingly rare, but it can be seen. Um, and so uh, we sometimes screen it if patients have um, symptom, symptoms or if we're about to put them on uh, chemotherapy, we wanna know if there were any brain meds prior to starting chemotherapy. Unfortunately, once the cat is out of the bag or the tumor is in other areas, we really don't have any curative options. Um, and uh, this is uh, unfortunate. And um, I think that the field is advancing um, significantly over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, uh, but so um, it, it is something that is difficult for our patients who are new to the diagnosis to accept and to, um, um, to kind of absorb. Um, so how do we look for areas of other disease? And I know that I think Dr. Doug Ball tomorrow was having a session about this, so I won't har uh, belabor this, but um, uh, in our patients who are newly diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer, oftentimes um, it was found on some kind of imaging, but the standard test is the ultrasound of the neck, a really good ultrasound. It's the best way of distinguishing lymph nodes and blood vessels um, uh, from each other. And um, the ultrasound gives us some quality of the uh, abnormality in the lymph nodes that we can see like calcifications and um, a very, very good test, um, especially in experience centers. Now, um, you know, there are some ultrasonographers at various centers that just do a quick sweep and they're not really interrogating the lymph nodes, um, uh, but uh, uh, a good ultrasound with uh, interrogation of the lymph nodes is very important. Now, if a patient has a lot of lymph nodes already involved with thyroid cancer that we could see on ultrasound or they happen to get a CT neck um, that showed it, that's when I would include a CT neck uh, and CT chest and uh, imaging of the abdomen with CT or MRI uh, with dedicated liver imaging because again, <clears throat> liver is this uh, area that uh, is uh, preferred by medullary thyroid cancer. Now, um, I do a screening of the spine for bone metastases, not always at the very beginning of their diagnosis, um, but tend to do it um, because it's just that it's a lot of imaging and the MRI is a longer imaging study. You are in a tube. It could be feel, feel very confine, confining to our patients. So I typically do that if after their surgery, um, their calcitonin is still over 250 or 300, then I'll kind of scan their spine to see if there's any lesions that we should be aware of. Um, in this um, uh, ATA 2015 guidelines, it also includes bone scans. I don't tend to use bone scans because bone scans are very insensitive for if there were small spots, it's not going to pick it up. And so um, I don't tend to do that. Um, 
uh, imaging. Um, then uh, the, the bottom is talking about PET CT. So um, uh, the typical pet, like FDG pet, a glucose pet, or F-DOPA pet, we don't tend to recommend that for uh, medullary thyroid cancer. However, if it's done, because a lot of oncologists are very used to the glucose PET CT for their other kinds of cancers, if it's done and it's positive, uh, where something lights up, more likely than not, that's disease. But um, with medullary thyroid cancer, oftentimes they won't absorb the radioactive glucose and thus these scans can be negative. So just because a, a glucose PET is negative doesn't mean you don't have disease in that location. It just means nothing lit up in that location. So that being said, there is a special uh, uh, PET called a gallium dotate PET, which we do uh, it, we have available to us in the United States and we will use that uh, in certain situations. And um, just because of sake of time, um, I I'll just briefly go over. I tend to do a gallium dotate PET when my other imaging modalities, CAT scans, ultrasound, MRIs, is not showing much change of known lesions or just areas and they look clean, but their tumor markers are rising. So if calcitonin or RCA are rising and my routine imaging doesn't show anything, then I'll tack on a gallium dotate at the next um, visit. Gallium dotate is just, um, it's a lot of radiation. It is a CT of your whole body. Um, so it is more exposure to radiation. It's also exceedingly expensive. Um, and sometimes insurance companies will not pay for it unless we have justification. So my justification is what I just described. So um, uh, oftentimes in our patients new to the diagnosis, uh, we will talk about that the initial treatment is surgery. Surgery to remove the entire thyroid gland. And if we know of any lymph node metastases to do a dedicated lymph node dissection. Um, when the tumor is uh, still confined to the thyroid gland, uh, that is the best situation for potential curative intent um, because it has not yet spread to other areas. Um, in our patients with MEN, and two who uh, were just identified because of a family member, then we sometimes recommend a prophylactic thyroidectomy uh, for those uh, uh, patients um, and uh, before they have manifestation of the medullary thyroid cancer. Um, we uh, always, uh, if you haven't done the genetic test yet, if you don't have the result back, we want to rule out pheochromocytoma prior to the thyroidectomy. Um, you do not want a patient undergoing general anesthesia on the table, having a hypertensive crisis because they had an underlying pheo that you did not know about. So we'll check for adrenalines uh, prior to um, the uh, thyroid surgery to rule it out. Um, and I actually do recommend that uh, we wait on the germline ret mutation test result before um, uh, undergoing surgery so that you know the risk to the parathyroids. So if a patient has a 634 mutation, we know that they have a high chance for a, a parathyroid hyperplasia. So when the surgeon goes in, maybe they don't need to remove the parathyroids yet because they're not hyperfunctioning, but certainly you want to know where you left them after the surgery, that you didn't just accidentally remove it with the thyroid specimen or re-implant one and um, forget where you put, put it, right? So um, it, it, uh, not that our surgeons forget per se, it's just that um, uh, we, we do want some thoughtfulness about where those parathyroids are left behind, uh, especially if there is a genetic risk for hyperplasia. Now, this is uh, one of the hard parts to uh, convey to our patients and their family members is that, unfortunately, one, uh, once medullary thyroid cancer has spread to other areas, um, as, uh, even the, the lymph nodes, uh, it's, uh, there's a high chance for residual disease after the surgery, meaning that we'll still see high calcitonin or CEA levels. So even in the patients with no lymph nodes involved, so they undergo their thyroid surgery with the central neck dissection, and it's, uh, it's pathologically, no lymph nodes are involved with thyroid cancer. In those patients, even they, 38% will still have residual disease by detectable tumor markers. Uh, and this is mainly because, um, uh, unfortunately, there might be some microscopic cells sitting in another lymph node that the surgeon did not think was abnormal, did, could not reach, did not remove um, uh, for various reasons. They look normal on imaging, um, but 68% um, will have cure. 
The patients with the lymph nodes already at presentation, that risk for um, continued disease rises up to 90%. So um, I say this because I tell my patients that I'm always an optimist. I always hope that surgery will lead to biochemical cure. But the reality is you already have a lymph node involved with the thyroid cancer, even in the hands of our best surgeons, um, there's a likelihood of 90% that we will still see detectable tumor markers because of microscopic disease. Hi, Dr. Hu, this is Abby. Yes, Abby. I'm, I'm, oh. the, I'm the volunteer here that came in late. Yeah. Um, you have, yeah, sorry, you have 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you so, so much. I just want to and remind you of the time. Yes, so now- yes, exactly. So um, yeah, it, it, this always is longer than I uh, expect. And, and for all those people who are attendees who might be my patients, you know, I spend a lot of time with you all <laughs> on that first visit and um, I go through all these things. But so I'll go through the rest pretty quickly. So how do I monitor after the thyroid surgery? Um, this is just the paradigm. It's not for you to read it, but the, um, the uh, recommendations from the guidelines is to check every six months for the first uh, two years, but I actually check a calcitonin and CA uh, three months after the surgery because calcitonin and CA, they lag a little bit after um, surgery, but um, after about two months, they will reach their most bottom valley point. So a three month time check is a, is a good time. And then that tells me how much of a drop they got. And then um, I know that for the six month visit, do I need to add on any other imaging like an MRI of the spine? Um, we, uh, I won't talk about doubling time um, other than the fact that uh, there is a fancy calculator on the ATA website um, that you put in your numbers of calcitonin and CA um, and it gives you a doubling time. It's not a straightforward 100 to 200 to 400 to 800. It's actually a very complicated equation. So you can't re- really just do it in your head. But if the doubling time of calcitonin or CEA is less than a year, it does correlate with worse survival and worse uh, and more likelihood for recurrences. So this is just the graph of the patients in black with the um, calcitonin doubling time over a year. And the red are the ones with the doubling time less than a year and survival changes and also the recurrence free survival. CEA doubling time might be actually a better predictor because calcitonin does have a lot of fluctuation. So CA doubling time might be a better predictor. Um, uh, talking about MTC related symptoms, we talked about diarrhea. Oftentimes it's just uh, a lot of medicines to help with the diarrhea. Sometimes if the diarrhea is still very, very bad, we might need to think about surgery to remove uh, a tumor that is growing preferentially or chemotherapy in that setting. Um, Cushing syndrome, uh, these patients, um, there are some medicines to block the cortisol production, but uh, more often than not, um, we uh, we recommend uh, adrenalectomy where we remove part of the, um, the cortex of the adrenal so that we can address the Cushing's. So um, in the five minutes um, or t- t- three minutes that I have left, um, I'll just kind of uh, go running through chemotherapy because honestly, this is not what you really need to have early on in your disease diagnosis, but it is something that I educate my patients on so they know what's out there, okay? And so um, we already talked about hereditary MTC. The driver is the abnormal RET mutation, which leads to an abnormality of the RET receptor. And this is a cartoon on the left of that RET receptor. And just to emphasize that the uh, the intracellular portion of that receptor is what harbors the tyrosine kinase. And um, when RET is abnormal, it causes this receptor to be activated and this kinase enzyme is active and it leads to cell survival and, um, and uh, proliferation uh, unchecked. Now, in patients with a non-hereditary medullary thyroid cancer, um, they can have a somatic mutation. And somatic means that this developed after birth in any cell other than the sperm or the eggs. So it is not passed on to your offspring, okay? So it's not hereditary. But in our non-hereditary patients, RET is also commonly found in about 45% of the non-hereditary patients. In about 15%, RAS mutations, HRAS, KRAS, NRAS, 
else can be seen. Um, and so sometimes we recommend uh, checking for mutations in our patients. Um, now, uh, these kinases, so RET is here on this little tree. It shares a lot of homology with other kinases that drives cancer. So lots of different cancers are regulated by abnormal tyrosine kinase activity. And one of the most important kinases is this thing called VEGFR2. So VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor. This is when a tumor is in a hypoxic or low oxygen environment. That stress causes the tumor to produce this abnormal protein called VEGF, or, um, and that stimulates more blood, ve blood vessel formation. Blood vessel formation then allows more nutrients to feed the tumor. The tumor grows, and now it has a way to pass on to other places. So medullary and other thyroid cancers overexpress VEGF. So, um, and I'm just gonna go by these, this cartoon, but this is a table that shows you all the different drugs that are kinase inhibitors that have been studied in medullary thyroid cancer. The green ones are all the ones that are approved for thyroid cancer. The ones in the box are the ones specifically for medullary thyroid cancer, cabozantinib and vandetinib. And this table is very busy, but it's to emphasize that they all target this receptor called VEGF, but they also have some targeting against RET, and that's why these drugs were studied for medullary thyroid cancer, and eventually um, they were approved after large phase three trials. So uh, we are now 11 years after the initial approval of vandetinib for medullary thyroid cancer in the U.S. It was shortly approved in Europe uh, the following year, cabozantinib approved in 2012 in the U.S., so we are getting up to the 10-year anniversary of the approval of uh, cabozantinib. So wanted to emphasize that again, um, you know, prior to 10 years ago, we had no drugs approved for thyroid cancer. And it was only through clinical trials and investigation that we it came as far as we have, and we've uh, gone even farther. So um, I know that we only have three more minutes, um, uh, but I do want to talk about RET. Uh, so we talked about medullary thyroid cancer patients, hereditary and non-hereditary can have RET mutations. Other kinds of tumors can have RET fusions or like in papillary thyroid cancer or lung cancer. And so with that, um, there was a lot of development in RET inhibitors. So I have on this table, cabozantinib and vandetinib up top, which are the multi-kinase inhibitors. They target multiple kinases. But pralcetinib or blue 667 or selpercatinib, loxo 292, they were designed specifically to target RET. And that's why this IC50 is so low. It's very potent at targeting that receptor. Um, and so with that, um, they led to uh, phase one, phase two trials that began in um, 2017. These are the waterfall plots for selpercatinib. These are the waterfall plots for pralcetinib. Long story short, both drugs work very well, uh, led to about between 60 to 70% of our patients having shrinkage of their disease, uh, tumor markers dropping within two weeks, diarrhea resolving within three days, um, led to 2020, both drugs being approved for RET mutated medullary thyroid cancer, RET fusion non-medullary thyroid cancer, or RET fusion lung cancer. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the issues with these drugs and potential side effects here. Um, these slides are uh, here. If the, Gary would like me to share these slides, I'm happy to share it with um, the group uh, to, um, to spend. But um, I wanted to just um, let you all know that um, the field of medullary thyroid cancer is, uh, uh, is growing. More and more investigators are interested, more and more basic scientists are interested, more and more pharmaceutical companies are interested. And with that uh, led to a lot of development. Um, and I, I know that we only have one minute, so uh, and lots of questions. Um, and uh, I do hope <laughs> that these questions, we can roll to the next session. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, there is another session at one, uh, session 153, also, if people have questions, you can email them to us at, and I put it in the chat, conference at FICA.org. We will collect them. And Dr. Who, I will, we will be sending them to you because you have nothing else to do. 
Um, right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do apologize. I, as many of you all know, I am very verbose. Um, I am very passionate about this, um, uh, this disorder. And um, I, I do hope that I can help. And I'm always here to answer questions. Thank you all. It is greatly appreciated. I think everyone can uh, thank Dr. Hu for her very, very thorough uh, presentation. No, it's wonderful. And I've learned a lot. I'm sure a lot of people have as well. So, Thank you. Knowledge is power. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And join all Dr. Right. Who at 150, uh, session 153. Following. Yep. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye.